So what I'm going to do today is to discuss the changing roles of agriculture and food sector in Asia. So the whole region uh, has undergone a rapid transformation for the last two to three decades. The share of agriculture has declined, uh, whether it's in terms of uh, GDP or whether in terms of employment. The question is whether agriculture still has a role in terms of uh, poverty reduction, hunger reduction, and overall economic growth. So I have three key messages for you. Uh, number one, the food security in Asia uh, is still under stress. And number two, the so agriculture needs to be adapted to dynamic changes and emerging uh, trends. Uh, as I said, the region has un undergone uh, substantial changes. Some of the global factors will also affect the region. And policies and uh, investments must be redesigned to promote agricultural growth for broader development outcome. So I came here in a very good time. So I just finished the uh, G20 meetings together with um, 20 ministers, ministers of agriculture from G20 countries, plus 10 representatives of the 10 international organizations. So we had two days intensive discussion and we jointly agree on certain actions that needs to be taken urgently to tackle the global food security issues. So I will share some of my reflection from, from uh, this meeting. So even right now, today, the 13 Asian countries have very serious and alarming levels of hunger. So India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Nepal are some of the countries that have very high level of hunger. Uh, their level is very amount. So this is very ironic. The Indian economy has been growing at 7%, 8%, some years even 10%. And agriculture was also growing at 3%, 4%, although in the last two or three years, agriculture growth has come down. The hunger rate, poverty rate, remain very high. So there is a disconnection between growth, this overall growth, agriculture growth, and improvement in nutrition and health. So this is not only true in India, but also true in many other parts of Asia. And even within the same country, there is great variation in terms of poverty and hunger level. India, three types of states. So one, one type is the many states are in serious uh, level of hunger. So the level of hunger is very serious. The four states in India are classified as serious in terms of the hunger and the poverty level. And the 12 states are benign. And the one state is extremely benign. So in many parts of India, the hunger level is similar to some of the African countries. And as you know, the income level in India is much higher than that in Africa. And the growth rate in India has also been much faster than that in Africa. But many parts of uh, countries still have similar level of hunger in the world. And in Asia, many countries are moving from low income status to middle income or even high income. However, in some of the emerging economies, some of the rapid growing economies, the number of hungry people, hungry, uh, number of uh, poor people remain, remain very large. China and India together account for almost 70% of the region's total hungry people. So we call it a missing middle phenomenon. So despite the rapid economic growth, despite agricultural growth, despite improvement in infrastructure, in education, and in many parts of the uh, region, we have also seen a rapid improvement in living standard. But the number of hungry people remains in large. And middle income countries account for almost 90%, 86% of 
of the total unannourished people in the region. So this has implications on our public weapons strategy. On the one hand, we have to focus on some of the poorest, small countries. On the other hand, how can we really make sure that economic transformation in some of the large emerging economies can uh, have it translate into nutrition and a health outcome. And food security is currently, currently under stress from a number of factors. The population is, is continuing to grow. Uh, the region is becoming more urbanized. The land and the water will continue to be constrained or limited. The climate change will hit the region soon and very hard. Food prices have become very, very high and volatile, and the rising energy prices and biofuel expansion will really change our, our future food security. So by 2028 in Asia, we will see more urban people than rural people uh, in the region. So you will see in the next few decades increased population will occur in the urban sector. The rural population remains to the constant the same. So by 2050, uh, the 60, 65, 70 percent of the total population will be in the urban area. The more urbanized people with higher incomes will demand more and better food. The global food prices have fluctuated dramatically in the last two or three, three, uh, three years. Remember in 2007, 2008, the global food price increased by 100% in a period of one year, in some cases six months. The so rice price increased from, uh, from increased by almost 100% uh, from the end of 2007 to April 2008. So within a short period of six months, rice price doubled. And just after three years, we have experienced another food price hike. Since last June, uh, wheat price uh, has increased by almost 90 percent. Maize price increased by by 100 percent. And uh, this time, this this round of the food prices differs from the previous one in that the meat prices, meat prices, and uh, prices of uh, dairy products have also increased. China, India, uh, are experiencing rapid, rapid price increase in meat dairy products. And if you look at the, uh, the price of rice in Indonesia and Vietnam, you will see the rice prices have become higher, but also more volatile, particularly in the case of Vietnam. And I'm afraid this trend will continue. So the regional prices, global prices and domestic prices will remain very high and will remain volatile. And then the water in the region will become even more constrained. It is in some of the poor countries, or poorest country, where the land degradation will be most severe. So for example, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, South Asia, Pacific regions. These are some of the poorest regions in Asia, in Asia. So they are experiencing a rapid land degradation. And areas of physical and economic water scarcity have increased and will increase further. So northern China, again, uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Central Asia. And so we'll experience both physical and economic water scarcity. We just finished a one-day meeting uh, with ADB for water, water, and water. Would be a big challenge for the region. In fact, ADB has identified water as one of their top priorities. The climate change will affect agricultural and food security through different ways. The climate change will cause higher temperature, will cause different patterns of precipitation, sea level will rise. We have seen more frequent extreme weathers. Floods, droughts in Australia, floods, droughts in China. China 
first time experienced two historical droughts. Just this year, in last six months, in February, the northern China experienced a historical drought. Seven provinces in northern China, later wheat producing regions, experienced severe drought. And again, in May, early June, the severe drought occurred in the middle part of the country, along the Yangtze River. And right after the drought, there was a big, big flood. So, drought followed by a big flood. And I'm afraid this extreme weather, extreme weather events will become more often, more frequent. And the severity will become even greater. And clearly, the climate change will reduce the crop yields. So, if the model, if the impact model shows that the rice yield will be reduced by more than 10% before 2050. 2050. Wheat irrigated wheat will be reduced by almost 14%. And again, it is some of the poorest country, poorest region, sub region in Asia where the climate change or the impact of climate change will be the most severe. So for example, um, South Asia, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, Southeast part of China. So we will have great loss in uh, rampant wheat as well as, as, as uh, rampant rice. And the climate change will lead to loss of arable land, fertile land. So if the sea level rises by one meter, Vietnam will lose one third of their uh, rice growing area. Myanmar, Thailand, and Cambodia will also lose quite a bit of this fertile uh, rice area. If the sea level rises by three meters, then the impact in Vietnam will all start. And the impact in Myanmar uh, will probably triple. Again, these are some of the regions where the hunger level, poverty level, are very high. And in the last two or three decades, we have seen the increasing, increasing correlation, a strong correlation between oil price and food price. Since 2000, the correlation coefficient between food price and oil price has become more than 0.9, So it's a like perfect correlation when you have 0.9%. When you do a regression, I don't know how many have you run, how many of you have run the regression. So when you have an R squared close to 0.9, that's, that's a great number. So 0.9, 0.91% correlation coefficient really indicates that Wherever there is high oil price, there will be a high food price. And as you know, oil price fluctuates very volatile, volatile over time. So if there is a strong correlation between oil price and food price, the food price will follow oil price. And, and rising oil price will trigger the extension of the biofuel production. When the uh, oil price reaches hundred dollars per barrel, even without even without subsidies, the biofuel production will become economically viable in many parts of the world, including the U.S., which is a major major uh, user of the base for the biofuel production. So today in the United States, one point one hundred thirty million tons of maize is being used for biofuel production, which is only slightly smaller than the second large, large producers total maize production, that is China. China every year produces 150 million tons of maize. The US alone uses 130 million, maybe 140 million tons of maize for biofuel production. The whole China's maize production can be easily converted to biofuel production. And it pre, again, it pre model sh shows that from 2000 to 2007, 30% of the food 
price rise is due to biofuel expansion. The world bank even gives a much larger number. That's from 2005 to 2007, or two years, three years. 75% of the food price increase is due to uh, biofuel production, although that number is highly uh, challenging. But it's clear that the biofuel production has been involved in big, big factors behind the global food prices. In 2007, 2008, food prices. The three major factors. One is biofuel production. Second is weather. The weather triggers triggers the panic. Then the export banks. So why they impose export banks? Because price goes up because of weather, bad weather. In 2007, 2008, some of the weather problem in Asia trigger the rise of export banks in China, Vietnam, Cambodia, India. That ban bans that further exacerbated uh, food price increase. And many countries also begin to be uh, to import rice at any price or can purchase Philippines and so on. Oil, in, uh, oil export countries in Saudi Arabia imported rice at $1,000 per metric tons. So panic, panic bans and purchase exploited food price in 2007 and 2010. So what is the role of agriculture uh, in Asia? It's clear that the share of GDP from agriculture has declined. In East Asia, that share has declined to 10% and 12%. Now in China, the share from agriculture is only about 10%. India, about 18%. However, the employment, the share of employment remains very strong. Even in 2020, the share of agriculture employment will be more than 50%. So which means, despite the declining role of agriculture in GDP, and their, their role of employment remains very strong. The smallholder will continue to be a phenomenon in the region. In fact, the size of the farm or the will continue to decline. So between 2005 and the, uh, sorry, between 1970, 71, and 2005, the average farm size in India declined by, by half, by 50%. And that trend will continue because it increased population, so population in India will continue to increase. And probably by 2027, India will become the most populous country, overtaking China. The land is very limited. The rural population will continue, continue to rise in India. Farm size will continue, continue to decline. But this is also true in Nepal and Pakistan. So many, in many parts of Asia, the farm size will continue to and the yield, the growth rates of yield have declined in the last decade. But remember, during the Green Revolution period, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, the major serious grain had increased by 5%, sometimes even 6% per year. So growth rates, 4%, 5%, 6%. Were very long in the 70s, 80s. But today, after 2000, that growth rates have come down dramatically to 1.5% to 2%. So the growth rates have come down by more than half, despite the rapid population growth. And Asia it has experienced more diversified consumption and production. In fact, it's more diversified into Livestock products, eggs, milk, meat, and fruit. And in Asia, production and consumption patterns are consistent and exactly stable means. The stable crop production, uh, sorry, consumption have declined from 1990 to 2007, but the production continued to increase. 
and there is a large gender gap between men and women in agriculture. In unequal access to land, to water, to agricultural services, to seeds, to fertilizers. That's led to a large difference in productivity between men and women. So not because women are less productive than men. The difference in productivity is caused by difference in the access to assets, technology, inputs, and type of water service. In the case of China, the majority of agriculture is done by women. 80%. 80%, 80% of agriculture is done by women. However, majority of agriculture segment workers are men. So how can men serve female workers, agricultural workers? This is also true in other parts of, of the world, India. The majority of India extension workers are men. And if we close that gap, if we close the gap between men and women, in terms of their access to technology, assets, inputs, there will be large gains in, in production productivity, 2.5 to 4 percent gain. But more important is a gain in terms of hunger reduction. So if we narrow that, if we narrow that gap, the, the number of undernourished people will be reduced by 12 to 17 percent, which really means that more than 100 million hungry people, undernourished people, will be reduced simply by very integrity. The conflict of agriculture in many parts of Asia, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, but they are still in the set of conflicts. And agriculture is part of the reason. Afghanistan, the drug mode to the parts of Afghanistan to control the production they control the market, all the production as the market causes a lot of conflicts. And the question is how can we really help these farmers convert their production from opium to vegetables, fruits, meat, and similar in Pakistan. So there is a high correlation between agricultural growth and agricultural opportunities and conflicts in parts of uh, Asia. And you probably have read the news or you have yeah, watched news in some of the uh, from the Arab countries, the so-called Jasmine Revolution. Yemen, Egypt, Tunisia, uh, Syria. My experience in some rap rap revolution. The one of the reason is rising food prices and increasing underemployment, unemployment, unemployment rates. So young people do not have good opportunities in agriculture sector. So they cannot derive a decent life from agriculture sector. So they move to the city, but in the meantime, cities cannot provide decent jobs for this as a fundamental process of rights in many parts of the Middle East. So if we don't do something in Asia, I'm afraid we will also see rights. So young people do not have employment opportunities. They want to move to the cities, Meantime, agriculture cannot provide good opportunities for them. So we needed to take some actions. So IPRI has been very actively supporting the G20 uh, agenda. You know, the G20 is a group of countries, uh, including G8 traditional, or traditional rich countries, G8, plus some of the emerging economies, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia. So in this part of the world, this Japan, South Korea, China, India, Indonesia uh, are part of the G20 countries. So it is the first time the G20 countries ministers of agriculture came together and debated how we can take some urgent actions to address urgent global food security issues. So, I'm glad that IPRI has provided technical support uh, through meetings, through our publication, through our media. And we have reached, IPRI is, uh, is part of the, uh, the delegation. There were 30 delegations, so 20, 20 
supported G20 countries, ten international organizations, World Bank, IFAB, WFP, FAO, and any place in Africa. So some urgent actions need to be taken. So the first is to invest productive social safety. We know that the people have to be protected in the short run. They need to access to food. They cannot wait. And then we need to make sure that we support the trans transparent, fair, and open trade. And then we need to set up regional strategic brain networks, particularly uh, parts of Asia and Africa, and prevent biofuel expansion. And in long term, uh, we need to pro promote small activity. So I will come back to each of these points. So invest in productive social, social sectors. The G20 declaration has one proposed action, that is to protect the most vulnerable. I think protecting the most vulnerable is necessary, but how we can make sure that short-term protection can lead to long-term productivity growth to the poor will be able to graduate from poverty. So they don't need protection in the future. So combining social protection or short-term need with long-term productive safety net is critical. And there are some successful examples. For example, Bangladesh Vulnerable Group Development Program. So that combines income generating activities and food security interventions together. So as a result, the per capita per capita food consumption has increased. As a result, uh, the assets of the poor are heavily built. And support transparent, fair, and open trade, particularly during the crisis. Before the G20 meetings, IPRI strongly urged countries not to use export bans to safeguard their own domestic uh, market. It's clear that it's a lose lose situation. So, like China and India impose rice export bans, the global food price increase, many other countries suffer, and India and China didn't benefit much from it. In the case of China, we have seen a, di a diversion between domestic prices and international prices. International prices begin to rise. Very fast, China's price stay flat. But on the surface, maybe it's good for poor consumers' benefit. But poor producers lost great opportunity to increase their income and to increase their investment for longer term activities. And then we calculated that there is large, large welfare transfer. The welfare transfer from, from producers to consumers. Producers lost billions of billions because of that export. And the consumers benefit. As you know, in China, in the case of China, most of the urban consumers are not poor. So they benefit from lower prices, although the food expenditure only probably accounts for 30% of their total, total income. And as a result of that, the farmers lost interest to invest in the proof long term. Activity. So, however, many G20 countries are not ready to sign an agreement not to use export banks. So, the, finally, the, the compromise agreement is given the national food security uh, that it is secure, the national food is secure. The countries are encouraged to open the market. But that definition can be used any time. Any countries can use that ban that uh, I wanted to secure the food supply in my own country. However, the progress, one positive side is that the uh, 20 countries agreed to let WFP, the World Food Program, to import or purchase grain from any other countries without banks. Even certain countries wanted to ban the exports. 
WFP were the people to purchase or import grains from that country. So no country should, should be allowed to ban WFP purchase. But it established regional strategic grain reserves. Again, this has been proposed by IPRI by the WFP uh, before the G20 meeting. So we suggested that a global grain reserve will help the poorest poor or poorest country by shipping the grains to a certain country during the crisis. So we can move the grains to a certain country very quickly. Between 2007 and 2008, the problem happened is because um, many countries always were facing double prices. So they, they didn't have enough money to import the fighter grains in Bangladesh. However, they also didn't have enough grains in the international market to import. So Bangladesh was struggling and the WRP was struggling. So we needed to set the regional grain reserves strategically uh, position in different places. For example, the Honda of Africa, somewhere in Djibouti, easy to access ports. In the meantime, it's also very close to some of the poorest countries, Somalia, Ethiopia, the region. Again, some water, water ground agreement was made. That is, G20 countries were asked the WFP to conduct a feasibility study. They didn't say, yes, let's go ahead. So it's a typical language. Let's do a your study. Give, give us a proposal. And if we will be part of it. So you create the we will work together uh, to do this feasibility study. To propose a pilot uh, program somewhere in Africa together with the African Union. So clearly, uh, there are many questions to be to answer. For example, what will be the optimal amount of the strategic reserve? And too much and very costly little to own work and where do you uh, store them and what triggers it needs and which country is qualified. So all these have to be animals. All these have to be proposed first. But I'm glad to see that in Asia this regional rice grain has been uh, has been working on it. The Asian countries are in plus three. China, South Korea, and Japan has already committed more than 800 million tons of rice. But this country is committed their national stocks to be used by the regional reserves. I think this is a great model. You don't need it to centralize grains in a place. It's a physical in a place. It's a commitment from the member countries. So I allocate some of my national stocks to be used by the regional reserve. During the crisis, we can move that grains to the poor country. So by doing that, you will help the most affected country. By doing that, you will also calm down international prices, the rice prices. So the ICM plus three, so far, um, that one has worked very well. But despite the rapid increase of wheat and maize prices in the last 10, 10 months and one year, the so rice price has only increased by 20%. So why is that? One is obviously um, the common position made by RCEP 3 not to use export bans. So that really worked. You see the bans on wheat, Russia, Russia introduced, uh, Russia and Ukraine introduced export, export bans on wheat. But in Asia, this time, no country has done that. In 2007, 2008, seven or eight countries in Asia used rice export. So this is a tremendous achievement. Then the regional reserve, that actually also increased the confidence of the countries. Oh, we have a regional reserve. And the region is also talking about the, the rice commodity exchange in the Sunday in Singapore. It's under discussion that in this we are moving towards the right direction. So the RCM plus 3 has really set a good example for other regions from Africa, Latin America, particularly uh, West Africa, uh, Sahel region, and the uh, uh, Horn of Africa. <coughs> and the prevention of biofuel 
central is a bust. Again, evidence has shown, there is evidence, not just one, showing that, show that biofuel production has been one of the major causes of a food crisis in 2007, 2008, and the recent round of crisis. But many G20 countries are very reluctant to agree to cut down the biofuel subsidies to prevent further biofuel extinction. So finally, the agreement says more studies, both is a bit disturbing to look at to find new technologies that will not use the grain-based biofuel. Grain-based biofuel will not compromise food security. So it's a well done agreement. And I personally, I really wish we could use some stronger language in countries to really reduce the subsidies. I'm glad that the US Congress passed a law to cut down the budget just two days ago, despite the uh, Secretary, Secretary of Agriculture, Bill said, made a statement just before the G20, how biofuel production in the US has generated employment, has helped to uh, reduce, uh, revive, reduce the uh, oil price. So let's see whether this uh, uh, reduction of biofuel subsidies will have any impact on biofuel production in the US. And many countries have um, introduced so-called mandates uh, to use renewable resources, renewable energies, and their total energy. For example, in Europe, 10% by 2020. In the rest, they have similar mandates in various high states. So we argue that that man mandate percentage should be flexible. And when food prices reach to a certain level, I think we should really abolish the mandate. And once the price comes down to the you know, we can come back again 10%, 15%, 20%. We do believe that uh, the renewable resources, renewable energies are the solution of the future, but uh, do not use grains, do not convert grains uh, to biofuels. So that will cause further food crisis that will compromise poor people's food security. Now, improved smallholders productivity is a long-term solution. We know that 80% of the poor, hungry people in this world are smallholders. We needed to invest in uh, smallholder friendly agriculture IND for agriculture research to be tailored for smallholders. And we we'll make sure that smallholders will be able to uh, link to the markets. So one of the problems for smallholders is the price fluctuations. So the G20 declaration agreed that the World Bank will take a leadership to introduce a pilot to look at the different price risk management, how it Different means can be used to can be used to, to manage price price fluctuations. For example, weather-based insurance is a monthly approach. Approaches. Another approach is so-called hedging funds. The World Bank has signed an agreement with J.P. Morgan to manage the price fluctuations in different countries. For example, if there is a bond crop. Prices begin to decline, and hedge funds can go there to purchase the grains. So to make sure that the price will remain uh, certain level. When, certain, when the grain prices reach a certain level, then they will be seen. So the hedge funds begin to sell. So this is similar to, uh, to what India, what China did. The city price and the floor price. So the government uses its own funds to manage them. What China did. India did is to use their grants. And linking smallholder production with health and nutrition outcomes. But this is particularly important. 
because in many cases, the rapid increase in production has not led to health and nutrition improvement. Either um, the stable grains do not have enough uh, required nutrients, or the production pattern is not right. So I'm glad how is sitting here that through the harvest plus program, so we can add nutrients to certain crops, for example, iron and zinc to rice, uh, vitamin A to uh, to sweet potato. So children, women, it is the same, same food, but that food has higher uh, it's intensity of nutrition. So without changing its production pattern, without changing the diet pattern, so the nutrition status will be uh, really improved. And clearly, the uh, changing production pattern, for example, a more diversified production, uh, away towards a stable grains, vegetables, fruits, livestock could also help the nutrition and health. So smallholders have smallholders have a great opportunity to tap into that opportunity. In many cases the market don't work because the market does not reflect good nutrition. The same product or the same the same products but products with different nutrition and you don't see the price difference. So how can we make sure that we can correct that market effect. So certain public policy is needed to subsidize or investment to promote uh, more nutritious products, uh, more nutritious uh, repellents is basically important. And as I said, agriculture has a very strong role to play against the conflicts, particularly Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. And finally, invest in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Agriculture is part of the problem, coming for 30% of greenhouse gas emission, but it could also be part of the solution. Just to adapt the agriculture to climate change, and make sure that uh, we just we design certain policies to offset the negative impact of climate change, there's a requirement of $7 billion a year. $7 billion a year is required to adapt agriculture to climate change. And in Asia, today is a need of 3.5 to 3.6 billion. So just to make sure that the yields will, be, will remain the same, you need 3.5 to 3.6 billion dollars in the region. So how can we design certain strategies, policies to make sure that the debt adaptation can also help to mitigate so we need the right incentive, we need the right policy, the right investment to facilitate smallholders to move towards win 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 opportunities. Win on the climate change side, smallholders can help to mitigate the climate change, you know, adapt to climate change, and make sure that smallholders will also get a profit. So climate change funds proposed by many international organizations, 100 billion, 100 billion dollars a year, to make sure that that climate change funds will not uh, compromise food production, make sure that agriculture can access to that fund, so agriculture can use that fund to adapt it to climate change and to mitigate uh, the negative impact of climate change. And I think the most effective and sustainable actions must be country led and country owned. So I'm glad that Sarah says, Sarah, I'm still struggling with that, that name. So I think it's doing a great thing by bringing students here to train them, build a network, and they can really, really design their own strategy. They need their strategy. So without that capacity, they just cannot lead, they cannot try it. Okay, thank you very much. And now we get to the questions. Thank you, Dr. Fang. Uh, if you need to look, take a closer look at Dr. Fang's uh, presentation, please visit the Circa website. You will find uh, the video of his presentation by, Wednesday, uh, by Friday this week. So at this point, I'd like to invite our audience to use the microphones around the room to ask your questions or your comments to uh, our speaker today. 
Uh, please introduce yourself as well as your organization. Any questions or comments? Yes. Uh, if there's a policy, you know, when you videotape somebody, you should have the permission from that person. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> I, grant, I grant you this permission. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Emmanuel Barnando, a student from the College of Economics and Management, UPLB. Um, there are, I've read um, some articles where they said that uh, there is a causal relationship between energy consumption and economic growth. And for the case for the, um, for the Philippines, uh, the flow of direction is from energy consumption to economic growth. So I think it is a good idea uh, to expand uh, biofuel production um, to decrease oil price um, vulnerability. So do you think, sir, that um, it is more profitable to uh, to not expand uh, the biofuel production and just import um, fuel? Well, thank you. Yes, indeed, there is a strong correlation between energy consumption and GDP growth. Because GDP growth needs energy, needs inputs. However, that the energy efficiency converting the uh, energy into GDP really varies by country. For some countries, it's a 1% GDP requires 3% growth in energy and electricity. Other countries only requires 0.5. So there is a great, great room for many countries to improve their energy efficiency, either by changing their, uh, it's a, their economic structure or by introducing energy saving technologies. I think there the potential is great. And also the renewable resources, the renewable energies include many sources, not just the biofuels, solar energy, wind energy. And even within biofuel, the second generation use waste instead of grain waste will not trigger global food price increase. Yes indeed the biofuel to some extent can help to resolve energy problem to some extent, but it is not a solution. Even we convert 50% of the grains in the world to biofuel production, and it's, it only accounts for a small share of the total energy required. So biofuel production, grain-based biofuel production is not a solution to world energy problem. So this is clear. The biofuel production is also not a solution to our environmental problem. So evidence has shown that the biofuel actually does not need to net benefit in terms of cutting, cutting down the greenhouse gas emission, particularly when the biofuel production is subsidized, particularly when the biofuel production is produced in some of the temperate zone countries, let's say Europe, let's say parts of the West. But the biofuel production will cause tremendous pressure on global food security. Yes, ma'am, at the back, the one with the blue scarf. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fang, for your uh, well thought uh, presentation. I really like it. I have the two questions for you. Could we go back to the, uh, the slide with the um, uh, Vietnam um, rice price in Tung Tha, Vietnam? Very first one. Yes, thank you. Um, do you think, yeah, when we compare the retail prices uh, in Indonesia and uh, in Dong Thak, Vietnam, do you think that, it seems to I see that the price in Vietnam is more volatile, and do you think there is a differences uh, in uh, a mechanism that uh, to have the farmers, um, I mean, to stabilize the, the, the retail price um, between um, Indonesia and Vietnam? And, um, and my second question is, um, uh, when are all the issues, 
these views that you have talk about like um, climate change and uh, population uh, growth uh, taking take taken into consideration. So what do you think about the role of Vietnam uh, in uh, the global food security in the next 30 or 40 years? Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, we are very much against volatility. So we are not afraid of higher food prices. So higher food prices actually provide opportunity for farmers, for smallholders to increase their income and increase their investment. So they will produce more. So what are, what are we are afraid is high volatility. So high today, no tomorrow, and high again, no tomorrow. It is very often the case that when this when, when there is when there is a shortage of grains, prices become skyrocketing, and the farmers rush into production. And as a result of uh, increased production, the prices come down again. So this sort of a phenomenon has to be avoided. So many countries like Indonesia, China, India, uh, have introduced certain uh, price stabilized scheme through the government uh, grain stock management. So when the prices are very low, the government go to the market to buy, so called minimum price. When the price is reached to a certain level higher, the consumers become, become uh, as a real suffer. So in this case, the government will release the stocks into the market. These countries are already doing that. Sometimes they are not doing probably enough. I remember Vietnam actually released rice stock in March. That really helped to uh, calm down the domestic prices and global prices. So the government needs to design certain schemes, whether it's it's a buffer stock or certain hedging funds by working with the World Bank or JP Morgan to manage that price volatility. I think we do need to make sure that price volatility will not increase further. So this is not only true for Vietnam, but this is also true for many other countries, uh, Cambodia, Indonesia, the Philippines. Now in terms of uh, climate change, how does that affect Vietnam? Yes, indeed. Unfortunately, Vietnam is one of the countries that will be affected by the climate change most severely, particularly in the Mekong River Delta area. So every one meter, if the sea level rises by one meter, one third of rice growing area in Vietnam will be lost, will be submerged. But how can we make sure that we certain we have certain coping strategy. Well, at a global level, obviously, we have to work together to make sure that the greenhouse gas emission will not continue to increase. To make sure that in Vietnam, you have some sort of coping strategy. For example, uh, building dikes around your land, or maybe uh, change your platform uh, patterns to, uh, let's say, to, to fishery to other non-rice or non-crop activities. Or you introduce new varieties that can, uh, let's say, can, uh, can still survive under the submerged uh, situation. So Vietnam, indeed, can make a great contribution to global food security. Vietnam is one of the largest rice exporting countries. In 2000, in 1997, 1998, IPRI uh, had a project there financed by ADB to look at the rice trade and liberalization in Vietnam. In 1997-98, Vietnam had a rice export portal. So every year, the government only allowed 1 million tons of rice to be exported. The so IPRI study shows that if Vietnam liberalized its rice export market, it's from 1 to 4 million tons the producers will gain, the producer uh, were the poorest at that time. And the global, uh, global, the national food security actually will improve instead of, uh, let's say, suffer from the uh, trade demonization. And then the uh, Vietnamese government adopted that policy. So as a result, Vietnam began to export 
three million tons, four million tons, sometimes six million tons of gas in the international market. That really helped uh, the global food security. And as a result, the agriculture GDP in Vietnam uh, has increased by $200 million per year. And that increase is for every year. So that policy has been implemented for, I think, for 11 years, except 2008, when the Vietnam imposed the uh, trade restriction. So I really urge the Vietnamese government not to impose uh, rice export rates anymore. If poor consumer suffer from higher prices, the government can use more targeted approach to help this poor producer and uh, global market Thank you. Yes, Dr. Mrs. Thank you very much. Actually, I have three observations to ask. One is uh, the rising sea level is affected by global climate. The other one is the observation that there will be some kind of a regional, uh, or rather establishing a regional center for grain storage or something like that. And the other one, the other question is really, where is rice development and rice science moving into? Is it moving towards small farmers? Or away from the small farmers. Now, first, it's only global the effect of global climate on rising. So, I come across some kind of a rather interesting um, findings that, in fact, this uh, the fear of rising sea is not maybe negated by the fact that it is rather sinking of the deltas. For instance, the Krishna, Ganges, Irrawaddy, all of these delta and the Indian Oceans are in fact affected not by in other words the sinking the rate of sinking is faster than the rise in level due to climate change. And so the the main three kinds of uh, uh, process is there. One is that the reason for the sinking is that the rate of uh, accumulation of sediment is being prevented by the, the dikes and dams circling some of these uh, rural areas. The other one is the mining of uh, methane and the withdrawal of uh, water that have caused subsidies. And the dimension of course the Po Delta in Italy, where mining of methane in the 60s to the 70s had in fact uh, caused uh, almost three meters of subsidence. Now, we have a question now because in Bangladesh, I think, there is a big program to utilize the big reserves of uh, natural gas in there, not only over uh, Bangladesh. Maybe even uh, Myanmar and surrounding areas. So, in short, uh, well, we know that there is increasing sea level, but I'm not quite sure how far it is really being affected by the fear of global you know, warming. Uh, interestingly, in fact, I made some kind of review in some of the early results where we had. Uh, made some quite uh, revealing study that the rice yield is been reduced increasing night temperature. But when I review my own initiative, there was actually a difference. Uh, there was the daytime cooling, but increasing nighttime temperature. The increasing nighttime temperature is dependent whether you are growing rice and flooded you are growing rice as an upland system. Now, the, on the question of regional cooperation, I remember in the old days in, in the times of the Green Revolution here in Asia, in fact there was three regional cooperations of ASEAN 
on the manufacture of fertilizer. In the Philippines, for instance, developed or established the phosphate fertilizer. We have the Philippines with the strong collaboration with the Nauru government. The other one is that the potassium fertilizer manufacturing was established in Thailand and urea nitrogen in Indonesia. I wonder what the, the effect has been because these are basic inputs of any program in rice production, even food crop production, where, you know, fertilizers may be required. But moving on the third observation is that you made quite an em emphasis that where we should be moving towards in the future development of agriculture. And this is to attain rather, uh, you know, to put more attention to small farms. But judging from the new development, it seems that it is actually moving towards, you know, the developed countries. And uh, one of the fear, in fact, is that the small farmers would have a lower capability to get the benefit from this improved uh, technology because of the patent you know, ownership where some of the most uh, advanced technology is now in fact not available to the rest but will be cornered by some uh, private sector with the ability you know, to own and protect their patent rights. Thank you. All right. Yes, well, whether the climate change will affect, let's say, uh, sea level rise, or whether the, the other natural factors uh, will cause a sink, I mean, it has to be based on science. We do, we do listen to uh, the scientists from other fields, but after this, have to be evidence based. But even without climate change, we are facing similar, similar. Uh, not that we've seen that. For example, we do know that the extreme weather events have become more often, more frequent. Here in the Philippines, the same. China, India, Australia, even US, Europe, heat waves in Europe. So we do know that weather patterns have changed. So we do need to uh, introduce new practices, new varieties that can adapted to the environment. For example, if the planting season has become earlier, then we have to do research to introduce the varieties that can adapt to the early planting season. Uh, the more floods, can we make sure that certain varieties will be able to survive under the, the flood? Uh, water definitely will become, will become very scarce with and without climate change. And the yield is declining, with or without climate change. The soil fertility will decline with or without climate change. The climate change will just make everything worse, multiply its negative impact. And this, yeah, the smallholders, where the smallholders will benefit from economic transformation. I think there is a great opportunity. Many countries have shown that smallholders benefit during the Green Revolution period, smallholders in, let's say, in India, and during the agricultural reform period in Vietnam and China, smallholders benefited even without increasing their farm size. Productivity increased, prices have increased, their production has become more high value. So their income has increased by three, four times, the poverty rate has been cut. Now in the future, what will be the, the role of smallholders? First, I think the smallholders, the number of smallholders in Asia will continue to be very large, particularly in South Asia, Southeast Asia. In China, probably because of the rapid urbanization, uh, rapid migration, so there is a chance the farm size, particularly the population size, may increase. And that I agree with you, certain policies, like land planning policy, land market policy can be introduced farm size can be increased. 
But even bottom size increased. That's by, by twice, by three times. That would be not, if the productivity does not increase, I think the opportunities for them, they're still very limited. So by uh, diversifying their production to a higher value crops, by making their production to nutritious and health or healthy food, so the farmers will be able to sell their products at much higher prices. The consumer will be able to consume much healthier, nutritious food. So I see that there is win-win opportunities. Any more questions from this side? Yes, ma'am, Dr. Bob Ayer. Thank you. Uh, regarding Could you the, keep your question short? Yes. <laughs> regarding the emergency rice reserve, for example, the assay and testing that you mentioned, can you tell us more about how this is bank being managed, uh, the problems, and uh, you mentioned about uh, there's a need to reduce the operating cost of this uh, of this uh, mechanism? Because I, I, I agree, agree with you that uh, uh, this could be a potentially good tool to stabilize prices at the, the regional level. Thank you. Right, right now, uh, I think Class 3 uh, is working with ADB, with member countries, to set up the mechanism. So Indonesia right now is a chairman, is a chairman of the ASEAN Class 3. And they are really uh, spread, let's say, how do I say it? So they are really champions uh, in pushing that forward. I don't think we need a centralized physical location. It's very extensive. I remember 10 or 15 years ago, China, uh, not China, South Korea, and uh, Japan were discussing about a central location in China, in Danian. So they just save some rice there. Let's say, I don't know, half a million tons there for emergency purposes. I don't think that would work. What we try to do is to encourage the member countries to donate some of their grains from their own stocks. They have national stock. You don't need to move them to some to a centralized place. They just come into that grain for emergency purpose. So they, if there is a need, ASEAN has the right to ship that grain to certain countries or ask certain countries to release that stock. Not necessarily for somebody in the center. Now, how much is needed, I think, is another question. I would think we should really analyze which region, which countries are most vulnerable when the prices go up. Like Singapore, Hong Kong don't need this great reserve. Even the price double triples, I don't think they will have any hunger. So we have to analyze which countries are most vulnerable, which region of that country is most vulnerable. We have to guarantee at least 90 days of food supply. 90 days. Then we set up mechanism, make sure that if a region is suffering, suffer from drought, or from flood, or from any natural causes, they should have at least 90 days of rain supply. So we need to analyze that. And the trigger, trigger is not the price, the trigger is how many people will suffer from that. But obviously this is correlated, right? So high. the higher the price, the more people will suffer. So I think we still need to do some analysis, but some principles are already there. So not centralized, we need to make sure that we have to analyze where are the most affected region, where are the most affected people from the natural disasters, from high price shocks. Make sure that there's a mechanism we can move the grains there. And make sure that there is an independent unit that can analyze the trigger. So otherwise there will be a conflict of interest. So not from the member country, a conflict of interest. Some indi independent neutral unit. Maybe SIACTA or if can help to analyze that trigger. More questions from our audience? Yes, sir. Thank you.
very much, Dr. Fan, for that uh, lecture. I'm Dick Molina. I'm a student of the School of Environmental Science at uh, UPLB. Uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, number one, uh, what do you think is the role or effect of environmental pollution to food security and food production? And then number two, uh, in terms of long-term sustainability, what do you think is the maximum number of people in the world that uh, the present technology and world resources can support? Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, the, first, the first question, definitely industrial pollution, urbanization, has real effect on global food supply. The, uh, some of the uh, pollution in China, uh, from, from the mining sector, from the rural industry, have really reduced the, the grain production in many parts of the, uh, of the country. Uh, there is an estimation that a certain percentage of grains has been lost due to this pollution because of industrialization, urbanization, and underground water pollution. So I think we have to take this issue very seriously. China, India, uh, and these emerging economies is a rapidly industrialized countries got to take this issue seriously. Uh, if we have a research program to look at it, how the uh, water quality, pollution, water pollution will affect the uh, food supply, but also the quality of food, safety of food, not just the production, but I think we've got to pay attention to it. And your question about, okay, what is the capacity of, of this planet? How many people this planet can feed? Yeah. Okay, we have that kind of technology. I reckon I'm pretty confident on that. As long as we invest enough, as long as we promote the innovative environment, new technologies, open minded, we can feed more people. So 9.1, 9.2 billion people in 2050. And other people, enough people worried about whether we can feed them. I think the question is whether we can fail. Uh, the question is not whether we can fail. The question is what policies, what investment, what technology are required to fail. Uh, 9.2, I think 10 billion people can also be fed as long as we keep innovating, as long as we keep providing in every environment for new technologies to be used, including some of the biotechnology. But it's GMOs, non GMOs, modern and traditional methods have to be combined. Okay, any more questions for Dr. Hong? Yes, ma'am, over there. Good afternoon, Dr. Hong. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is related to trade off. It appears to me that um, in every solution that we uh, identify, there is a trade off between sectors. For example, we identify a uh, value food fuel expansion. It can address climate change, but it has a trade off in food security. A very wait, wait, wait. Say again. I didn't catch it. For example, um, we, we promote uh, value fuel expansion. It uh, addresses the issue of climate change, but at the same time, it has a trade off in food security. My question would be, a very pragmatic question would be, is there any possible way that we can, we can identify a perfect approach that, uh, that has uh, net benefit across all sectors? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, let me repeat what I have said in my presentation. Yes, there are many win-win opportunities that we can, we can promote. So, on the one hand, with adoption practices and technologies that can cut greenhouse gas emissions. On the other hand, the secure food supply. Yes, there are many, many win uh, opportunities, not necessarily trade offs. Yes, there are trade offs if you don't change the policies. Uh, so this is our job to look for win win opportunities, policies that can help the farmers to adopt sustainable technologies. Sustainable practices 
So that can help farmers to increase their income, their profit, and in the meantime, reduce, uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emission. What we need is to help to create that incentive structure for farmers to do that. And so compensation is also needed. Uh, I have seen some of the innovations already. So for example, in Australia, it's carbon farming. It's carbon farming, the farmers will be able to adopt certain practices. So the farmers will be able to increase their income. In the meantime, uh, they will also be able to cut down the carbon emission. In China, uh, one of uh, our colleagues, Ji Kong Kwan, I think he was associated with Sasirka before, is doing some very innovative research to use remote sensing to track the carbon, uh, carbon movement, or track the carbon uh, footprints. So the, the biggest problem right now is even farmers adopt certain practice when we really don't know whether they have contributed to greenhouse gas emission reduction. We need innovative ways to track, to monitor that in cost effectively. And you can, sometimes you can do it, but very, very costly. So some of the innovations are needed to look for certain ways uh, to track, to monitor the carbon emissions in a cost effective way and to design certain policies to promote good practices that avoid the trade off and uh, look for win win. Any more questions from the audience? Well, if not, I thank you very much. Particularly, I'm very happy to see another young students here. It's, it's really you, the future generation, who really should take care of our, our environment, our planet. Right? So, next 40 years, next 50 years, it's your generation. I'm glad to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you.